isn't free But I still, I still Assemblywoman Shelly Shelton sitting here with me, and she's okay. going to tell you some things right now. I would just encourage all your listeners to go to um, Assemblywoman Shelly Shelton. It's on my Facebook page. There's about three pages of information about different people being held in different jails. I think the whole intent is to, you know, transport them all up to Oregon. Um, maybe that's where the judges are favorable for them. You had asked about um, the judge's name. When we were there on Thursday, the judge that presided over those hearings was um, John Acosta. Um, okay. Lawless and violent. That's how a federal judge described Nevada rancher Cliven Bundy today in court. The judge said Bundy should not be released from jail. He was arrested last week at an airport in Portland on his way to support the armed standoff at that wildlife refuge. Bundy was arrested on charges stemming from another armed standoff with the government at his Bunkerville ranch back in 2014. As of right now, um, we don't have any verification or proof that anyone is taking our cattle. Um, and so that's what we're waiting for. We've been out and about and haven't seen anything. Um, so as of right now, we can't say that anyone is taking our cattle. Mm -hmm. um, how much, but, how much so we want to stop that rumor until it's proven. Right. If it's true, I will personally put it on the Buggy Ranch Facebook page. So in this case, them coming and collecting our cattle, that is something huge. That is our livelihood. That is our only income. That's the only thing keeping us going. Um, that would be out on our Bundy Rack Facebook page. So I guess before putting on rumors, um, I would just ask that you just double check with that Bundy Ranch Facebook page to see if there's any information out there on that. Mm -hmm. it's, kept, um, it's kept up current, Bailey? It's kept up current. I'm on it pretty much 22 hours a day. Oh, you're the, you're the one in charge of it. I am. Okay. This is coming out of... Um, K-O-I-N-6 News in Portland. Shauna Cox sues United States for $666 billion over works of the devil. Now, Shauna Cox was one of the original occupiers at the Malahar National Wildlife Refuge. Okay, you guys? You would remember that she was in a vehicle with LaVoy Fenicum. And here's how the article reads. It says, Portland, Oregon. Shauna Cox, one of the original occupiers at the Malhauer National Wildlife Refuge, who is now facing federal charges, has sued the U.S. government for $666 billion. The countersuit seeks damages from the works of the devil in excess of $666 billion, $666,000,000, $666.66. That's right, you guys. Now, this is serious. She's not kidding around here. Go, Shauna! Woo! She was among the first 16 people indicted by federal officials for her role in the takeover. She was arrested January 26th and released from the Multnomah County Detention Center on January 29th with some conditions. So uh, it says that the judge ordered that Cox neither own, possess, nor control any type of weapon while on release. Cox will also be under GPS monitoring and is under home detention, according to court documents. Cox is also prohibited from having any contact with any of the co-defendants in the case, including Ammon Bundy. In the lawsuit filed in Oregon, she claims that she came to the assistance of the economically vulnerable individuals who are being harassed, threatened, intimidated, persecuted, and incarcerated by arrogant, narcissistic federal government officials who have organized together to hijack and steal our constitutional form of government from the people of the United States of America. She also claims <coughs> evidence will also show that Oregon State Bar members, including S. Amanda Marshall, Governor Kate Brown, Judge Grasty, Oregon State Senator Cliff Bentz, and others within the Oregon State Bar Association organized together to take complete control of the Oregon State government so they could execute their personal objectives, agendas, and the objectives and agendas of the predatory Oregon State Bar Association. Cox states in a bold and underlined section, 
I am being maliciously prosecuted by state and federal bar association members because they do not want to be held accountable for the subversive activities against the people of the United States of America. There you, and there you have it. You guys can read this. Go to, um, you guys can just Google Shauna Cox sues U.S. for $666 billion over works of devil. And that's on KOIN6.com. And if you don't feel like reading uh, BS mainstream media reports that go along with it, the documents, I screenshotted each one of them, are up on my wall right now. Uh, Maureen Peltier Facebook page. Okay. And so you guys, um, also in this article, they have the PDFs of the um, – of the actual court filing you can see that there I just wanted to get this news out to you guys um, you know what I think um, I think Shauna Cox may be onto something here some updates here in regards to the Oregon standoff and what the legislators in Oregon are trying to do here trying to rush in a bill that is aimed at protecting the identity of Oregon State Police in shootings it just so happens they wanted to start with this one with Lavoy Finnegan. This raises more red flags for me. This House Bill 4087, it reminds me back when the Mike Brown, Michael uh, Brown situation took place in Ferguson. They wanted to keep the police officer's name hidden and quiet uh, for quite some time. And the people demanded that they knew. And after time, you know, everyone knew, and the guy was in hiding and fearing for his life. In certain situations, you can expect that. Especially when people may feel that um, someone was gunned down and killed in cold blood. Now, when the lead spokesman or, or the, the head FBI dude came out britzing that has a lengthy um, background on him himself and, and a lot of atrocities involved in the FBI, you only look into it. Well, he stated that the shooter was a tactical operator. This is the second time that terminology has been used on the men or the shooters that were on the ground. Now, let me just tell folks here that may not know some of my background. I've been across the country in several different places uh, reporting on shootings, get Ferguson, Cleveland, Baltimore, and shootings that have that have happened that I have not had a chance to get to on the ground. Um, regardless, whatever the shooting may be, Whatever instance, whether it was Akaya Gurley um, or, or whoever it was out there, Walter Scott shot in the back running away, they never, ever, ever in any of those stories ever rep referred to the police officers as tactical operators. The one time that I do remember hearing this is when the mercenaries were operating in Ukraine and they were called tactical operators. These are kill teams. And do you think Oregon State Police are the ones that climbed up in the trees with sniper rifles? My thing is this. They're trying to protect this man's name, but I'm not so sure that it was this man that did the damage. And Lavoie was shot multiple times. He was being hit with tasers. He was getting hit with bullets. They were launching rubber bullets, canisters. This wasn't all coming from Oregon State Police. I can tell you that. They were being called tactical operators, and anyone out there that knows any better sees where this is going. Now, they're trying to hush-hush the name of this officer. And at this point, they're going to have to stick to their guns with this. Maybe this officer did put one round in him. And that's all it took. They're, they're going to stick and say that this is the cop that did it. We all know multiple officers were on the ground. We all know multiple officers put shots into this man's body. cars going back and forth but uh, wanted to show you uh, 
Oh, hold on. Have, uh, come here and done their best to uh, cause problems. Some people have even uh, put swastika symbols on the signs of Lavoy Finicum. These people are just filled with hate and malice. And honestly, I don't think they realize that Lavoy was trying to fight for them. I'm doing my best to fix this up. Federal prosecutors said investigators combing through an Oregon wildlife refuge occupied for nearly six weeks by an armed group have discovered firearms, explosives, and trenches dug near artifacts. Attorneys Ethan Knight and Jeffrey Barrow also said in a court filing Tuesday that the FBI is concerned that militia members have booby-trapped vehicles at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Prosecutors say the occupiers appear to have dug two trenches near sensitive artifacts. The refuge contains artifacts and burial grounds sacred to the Burns Paiute tribe. More than two dozen people were arrested, including leader Eamon Bundy and his brother Ryan Bundy. Yeah, this is Eamon Bundy, and I wanted to uh, set the record straight and just. Uh, testify to of what we found when we went into the refuge. We found that there was artifacts scattered all over, um, that they were also in in uh, the basements and they were being, you know, just treated or ignored or or uh, there was files and, and things that were on top of them. We took care of them. We put them in primarily in one spot and we reached out to the to the uh, Paiute Nation multiple times. Uh, giving them opportunity to come out and to collect them and we also uh, offered that we would come take them to them. Um, they were, we understood that they were something that was sacred, that they uh, were not ours and we felt that it was uh, very important to take care of them and to not um, uh, defile them and uh, we did that. We also found many of the buildings at the refuge were in disarray. They had been uh, poorly taken care of, uh, you know, a lot of, of thick dust and, and uh, uh, animal uh, droppings, uh, rodent droppings, and we cleaned up that, those buildings and, uh, and uh, we made them orderly and we cleaned up and we began to do some rodent control there and uh, we knew that those were public buildings. We respected that, and we, we, it was our desire always to take care of them. Thank you. Brian, we've got breaking news on a Nevada rancher fighting the federal government. We just got word Clive and Bundy and four others have been indicted by a federal grand jury on 16 felony counts relating to the armed assault at Bundy's Bunkerville Ranch in Nevada in 2014. Now, he was recently arrested in Oregon when he went there to support armed militia members, including his sons, at a wildlife refuge. Now, the charges against him and two of his sons, who were also arrested in Oregon, include use of firearms and assault. No word yet on when Clive and Bundy will be brought back to Nevada to face charges. That's the latest from the Breaking News Center. We need to get people inside. And those four, you know, my feeling is we, we still hold the ground. Uh, we took a hit on the battle on the 26th, but we still hold the ground. And if we continue to hold the get ground, it will be a positive for patriots around the country. The, uh, right now, it's, is it a defeat? No, because we still hold the ground. But if it becomes a defeat, it's going to be disheartening. So if we can get some people in there to bolster this, now the problem is going in armed is, is a, a problem, but there are some weapons in there. I have no idea how many. Uh, Lavoie's room would have his arms in it. Uh, uh, Ryan Paynes would probably have his arms in it. Uh, Ryan Bundy, Ammon, uh, and the people that were arrested uh, probably locked their rooms when they le left, or perhaps nobody has gone into those rooms if they weren't locked. And so there would be some available weapons. I don't know what the four have, 
but uh, just enough to to hold things back. And if if that happened, then it might be another rally for people to come and r reinforce that. You know, continue to hold the ground. Yeah, but my concern is, you know, getting close to there. Um, they have that perimeter set up about six mile perimeter around. Um, even if people were to come, I'm not sure how they would get access to that location. Well, my understanding, uh, most recent, I think yesterday, is from the Narrows down to the blockade is open. If to the you, blockade, right. So are you saying just go to the blockade? Uh, but go to the blockade. Now, the problem is, uh, uh, the report I got was they've got the same configuration, one car in the center of the road f f uh, facing out, and two at an angle, same thing they had up at the, the shooting. Uh, but they're on our side of the bridge, which is an advantage because they could be pushed into the water uh, if they were overwhelmed. Uh, I'd, or in the alternative uh, to that ditch there that the bridge goes over, which is where the, the front end loader was, looks to be about four feet deep, but I don't know for sure. Uh, it's about 30 feet wide, uh, 30 to 40 feet wide by the bridge. So if people got to the barricade and split, uh, bo going both directions, and there 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 were no arms, uh, the government would look awful bad if they started shooting. That doesn't mean that they wouldn't, but then they would lose <laughs> a lot over that uh, blood on top of blood. But uh, there's also uh, other ways. Uh, perhaps they could get in without crossing that river, which would be over towards the east side or the southeast. Well, so I got a call, I'll just share with you too, I got a call this morning from um, Oregon State Police because they had saw the, the, all that information that was going around that I had sent you. Yeah. And they told me that if people come to the barricade, the, the barricade or the roadblock, that they would use whatever means, you know, appropriate force, whether it be, you know, arrest if people were unarmed, if people not arms, you know, whatever was needed. So my concern is now with all the hype and all the attention on this, that it would have detrimental results and still fall on, um, still back to square one. My other concern is, you know, when I spoke with David Fry a few nights ago before their comms were cut off, I guess it was the last night I was in Burns, um, you know, he made it very clear that he doesn't trust the Patriot community anymore and, and uh, it's just that those four there and that if anyone came, you know, they would be untrusted because it would be trickery and, you know, then I'm afraid of engaging in a firefight there. Well, but at the same time, he's asking for uh, help from the Patriot community, so it would be a matter of him feeling comfortable initially. Uh, you know, I know David, I met him, spent a, not a whole lot of time with him, but he was in the media center. And we talked a few times, and uh, I'm not sure if I know Sean or not. I think I recognize him. And uh, the uh, Jeff Banta, I'm not sure of, but I think he's the guy that was uh, one of the team leaders out of uh, out of the MOB. So they would, but I, I I'm not uh, up there. So, but yeah, yeah, you know, I, I know I'm back in Boise too right now. Um, I just I don't know. The problem is too is even if we were to go down that road, you know, a couple of different things. We're coming home to a point of no return, um, and then you know, manpower is always a concern too. Of who is going to show up and do carry stuff like that out, and the consequences of that. What's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, OMD li a mail list and participation has grown phenomenally. The other day there were forty five hundred and thirty two visits to the page and uh, about 40 new people have signed up for the mail list and my feeling is if they started cross country now they don't know if these guys are going to hold out or not you got four people surrounded and so if we had people in there uh, and, and the staying power was there uh, we would put out a call out and what I think might be kind of interesting if we could get you know hundreds or thousand uh, thousand people there and they formed a battle line like the old British and came up from the south that, that would overwhelm the, uh, the, the the guys there you know that line if we had a thousand people for example shoulder to shoulder would be three quarters of a mile if they had two two feet between them and it would exceed a mile in width right and that would be something that 
you know, nobody's been used to for since World War II. And even World War II, it's very rare that that occurred, but that goes back to the old method, which would be something unanticipated, to say the least. You know, you can't mow down all those people. Well, my only concern is getting that many people to show up. I mean, with, with um, my estimate on what's sitting in Burns right now on, on the FBI side, they've probably got three to 400 agents just the FBI side, a contract or whatever they are. Um, then you got your local assets. I mean, we would have to have 2,000 well-trained patriots to show up to carry anything out like that. And, and that's just, in itself, is something that I don't know if it's possible. Well, I think 1,000 would I mean, be... well-trained. I think 1,000 is, is, is enough. And as far as well-trained, uh, if they right shoulder arms and just march up there, uh, that would be intimidating in itself and would be interesting to see the consequences. Um, you know, as far as well-trained, uh, it's nice to have well-trained, but other people can fire weapons too. They've done their, you know, they're running around the forest playing soldier, and but they've gone to the rifle range, they can aim and squeeze. Uh, and I would hope that if we had that overwhelming force, we could avoid any bloodshed. That's the reason I, I think that that might be viable. Now, as far as participation, when I put the call out on the 26th, the one that you didn't like, and I apologize, but, you know, if we could have gotten 20 or 30 people in that night, we'd be far better off. Uh, I don't know why it dwindled so quickly. When I left there, there were eight or nine people there, and there might have been a tenth seal one, uh, but I wasn't asking Jason how many people inside. That's just what I caught from conversations that transpired between him and people uh, and I was assisting him primarily with the press uh, lining people up to, to interview him. Right, right. Well, and you know, we know, you know, we, you know, we put out several calls to action to during the entire duration we've been there and asking for help and, and, you know, at all levels. And, you know, the reality is everyone's going to, you know, everyone's going to be in place and have no issue and then as soon as the heat turns up, they, they bounce, you know, that's what, you know, as soon as the, as soon as the boy was shot, I mean, they everyone just kind of scattered, you know, and I think it was just, just a shock. No one expected that to go down that way, and so I think we're going to, you know, that's another reason why a lot of people just scattered and left. Well, you know, the people up there were more of a passive support than anything, because there were a lot of people contacting me, asking if it was time, and I put out that flyer, and then I, uh, or that notice, and then I rescinded it about uh 24 hours later and some people that were packing their gear ready to go there are a lot of people that will come to a non-passive event where they're not going to come to a passive event and this goes back to civil disobedience versus civil defiance mm -hmm. and you know if you think back to april 2014 how many people from las vegas i think the highway was two or three lanes but it was backed up four miles and most of those were militia uh, so, when there's a potential for something that's not passive, is more on the defiant side, uh, the participation is going to be a lot greater, but guys that have been training as militia don't want to hold signs. So, no, and, I, and, I, and I agree, um, but, you know, the concern is, like, where were those guys when this whole thing started, you know, it's kind of what we bounced back to the same wall again, you know. Um, I don't know, and I don't know, I don't necessarily know if uh, taking the offensive against the guys the barricade, armed or unarmed, is, is, the, is necessarily a good idea either, just because of, we saw what they do to an unarmed guy like the boy, you know, and I don't want anyone else losing their life. Well, Lavoie didn't have a gun in his hand, but uh, according to the people I've spoken with, he never went without the shoulder holster. They always left, left their weapons in the car, and the, the forty five revolver was probably in the car. Mm -hmm, right. uh, we know rifles were there. Uh, McConnell actually had his uh, pistol strapped on when he backed up to them and laid down. They disarmed him and, and cuffed him then. Ryan Payne got out without any weapons on. and. Uh, so you know their their normal pattern though was to have arms in the in the wep uh, in the vehicles and uh, in talking with two other people that um, Lavoie never went without his nine millimeter and it is tucked well under his shoulder so there's no bulge uh, or under his armpit so there's no bulge so 
uh, it appears he has it, at least with my investigation, there's no reason to believe that he didn't. Shauna got in the truck too late to see if he was armed. Uh, her, her and Victoria getting in there was because they missed the Sharp family uh, van that had left 10 or 15 minutes before them. And right. uh, Victoria was late getting ready. So, uh, you know, the, the, if we get people in, that would they, they would perhaps be subject to arrest uh, if we didn't uh, have the turnout. But the opportunity for a bloodless va battle, I believe, is there. One that we could win because, uh, you know, the there's a lot of sympathy for what's going on, but there's no active militia-oriented activity. And, and why did the people not come up? Well, what got uh, Ammon and everybody in that crew so complacent that they thought they could go in or anywhere without risk? Early on, I talked to Ryan, and I told him I thought there was a risk even going into town unless he had a good contingent with him. But over that month... Uh, I'm sure the FBI told Wade to back off, and Wade backed off, and I think it was a plan that they pulled out of a box and adapted to there. After the Bundy Ranch, they must have had their think tank working on uh, different situations, and one of those would be something not too unsimilar from this, where uh, they would allow the people to come out and become complacent, and then at some point when they knew where they would be and when they would be, or approximately when they would be, uh, they would spring the trap, and in this case, going through the forest was ideal for that. No phone reception, the Sharps tried to call, they couldn't get through. Um, curved roads, uh, minimum sight distance, and so on. Uh, you know, they, they planned it well. And uh, the right. complacency created in that uh, four weeks was just uh, fatal to Lavoy and, and uh, got everybody taken down, the entire leadership except Ritzheimer, who happened, and John's really not a leader, he's a good follower and very obedient, but uh, the, the leadership was taken out all at once. Well, and that's the thing is, uh, and that was something that I conversed with Ryan and uh, Ammon many times, like if you guys are out in the town and out and about, you need to let people know so we can be, you know, overwatch and scouting around. Uh, many times we'd be standing there and we'd watch them drive by and we're like, what? You know, they're in town, you know, and, and um, so it's like, you know, we're taking a lot of hits because we weren't there, but it's like, you know, we can't be somewhere we don't know. And um, that was an ongoing concern that we were always trying to address. And, you know, and I just, I know Ammon and how he goes. He's, okay, let's go. And they load up and go. You know, yeah. there's really not a whole lot of, okay, I'm ready, let's go. The guy was going 100 miles an hour, you know. And any anxiety it disappeared over those four weeks, if if he had any to begin with. What's that? Any anxiety over what might happen outside the refuge, if he had any at the beginning, was completely dissipated four weeks later because they did have the freedom to basically go where they wanted to go. Right, and and they did that on they allowed them to do that on purpose to get complacent. They what? They, they, I have no doubt that they allowed them to do that on purpose for those several weeks to get complacent. Yeah, I think it was part of the plan, and it was implemented very early on by telling Wade, let them go, let them go, let them go wherever they want to go. Mm -hmm. So the, the foundation uh, to make it easier to spring the trap later was there, and then when the opportunity came up when they knew most of the leadership, Shauna was the only one that went by accident. You know, she went uh, to take care of Victoria. But that was it, though. She was the final, really the final straw in the leadership there. Right, right. So they got a coup on that one, and I, it was well laid. They were just waiting for the opportunity to spring the trap after they realized the complacency had settled in. Now, do you think there was anyone from the inside feeding them information to help get that set up? I don't think so, because everything was public. You know, the, uh, you know, the fact that Shauna was there was different, but... Uh, uh, you know, they knew what time they had to be at John Day, uh, and okay. so then they had to leave at least two hours before that. And uh, even Lavoie uh, said, we've got 50 miles to go. So he was well-versed on the distance up to Tom Day from where they were, where the ambush, well, where the first stop occurred. Right, right, right. Uh, and there's only one way to Tom Day unless you want to drive an extra 40 or 50 miles. So 
and then it, it being ideal for uh, this type of ambush with the trees and the curved roads. So, uh, yeah, it, it was definitely an ambush. So we went up there and visited the site. And, you know, when I sent a team up right after they opened the road back up, and we got some photos, we got some stuff that you know it definitely uh, shows what their intent there was to do. You know, and there's no doubt in my mind that 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 was an L-shaped style ambush. That's military tactics. You know. Yeah, it was pretty uh, well. You know, if he had a little more momentum, had been able to get back on the road, and he may have lost that momentum when he, if you look closely, he swerved to miss that agent that jumped out in front of him. Yep. Just a yep, little. Exactly. Because in the snow, you can't turn sharply, but you can even see in the tracks that there was a slight turn. So him t uh, trying to save that agent's life cost him, it may have cost him his. Well, and he was on the brakes. If you watch the video, his brake lights were on for a good 200 feet because he was, you know, he was moving. But that. If you go stand up there at that corner, they put that roadblock just past the apex of the corner, and another 300 feet was a long straightaway. So yeah. you know, putting that in the corner was is uh, yeah, that's like a law enforcement 101 no-no in the cop side. That's more of a military tactic. Right, and they didn't expect him to get out of the kill zone either. Uh, right. They expected him to stop, and uh, but I don't know. It, it it worked, unfortunately. Yeah, I know it did. So. You know, the others are alive, though. Yeah. I, that was intended to take them all out. And apparently, Ryan Bundy still has a bullet in his shoulder, so the trauma center at the hospital apparently was not realistic because uh, if their, their trauma team was daytime only at the, a small hospital like that, uh, and there wasn't time to call them in, then obviously the FBI, the alleged FBI trauma team was not there, or they would have removed the bullet. Right. And as far right. as no, I know, he still got it. So. All right. Well, keep me posted on what you're kind of hearing. I'm not quite sold on that just yet. BJ's there on the ground, so he's been working on that, you know, trying to figure out how to approach that. Well, the latest out of Oregon now. The feds are vowing to arrest anybody traveling to Oregon with intent to engage in illegal activity. This next article comes from Eric Katz for government executives, so this is clearly going to be uh, biased in the government's position. It states here that, quote, the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge remains closed and it will remain closed for some number of weeks, according to FBI Special Agent in Charge Greg Breitzing, who said at a press conference on Thursday evening, quote, during this time, law enforcement will continue to man checkpoints at the edge of the refuge to maintain the security of this crime scene. The FBI will deploy bomb technicians to locate and mitigate any potential explosives, Breitzing said. Law enforcement and tribal officials will then spend weeks identifying evidence of crimes and assessing damage to documents, artifacts, and sacred burial grounds. Breitzing indicated that damage was significant and the cleanup effort would be intensive. He also warned any would-be occupier should think twice before following in the footsteps of the recently arrested. Quote, I want to make it very clear that we will continue to enforce the law with respect to the refuge and other federal properties. He said, anyone who chooses to travel to Oregon with the intent of engaging in illegal activity will be arrested. Now, here's where I'm going to divert off this article for a moment because I think the key word here is intent. How do they gauge intent? And I'm going to be willing to bet that they are monitoring anybody who has spoken about Oregon, who has spoken in favor of it, anybody. They're monitoring the blogs, they're monitoring social networks. They probably have the NSA <clears throat> picking up all the keywords relating to Oregon, sifting them out, and then stating trying to determine intent of the individual. <clears throat> now, in a blog post, FWS Director Dan Ash said any threats against federal workers would not be tolerated. It is unacceptable and criminal for any service employee to face threats of violence for doing his or her job, Ash wrote. I urge you to contact law enforcement professionals if you experience any coercive actions or threats. We are committed to protecting you and holding perpetrators accountable for criminal acts. The local sheriff in Harney County, Oregon, gave an emotional plea for those who oppose federal land control to voice their opinions civilly. He urged anyone who has a problem 
with a civil servant to write a letter and leave out any profanity. Yeah, write a letter, and then they just end up in the shredder. Mm -hmm. While the Malheur facility will remain closed for the foreseeable future, at least one federal office that closed out of safety concerns during the occupation has reopened. Yes, the Bureau of Land Management shuttered its facility in Burns, Oregon. Though no, occup no occupiers approached it, the office has now reopened on February 9th, according to a spokesman. So, there you have it the latest out of Oregon, and the unfortunate fact is that you now have American citizens who are simply occupying a federal building, just as Occupy Wall Street would be occupying Wall Street, except the difference was these guys were armed and they weren't going to take being maced in the face by police officers, and now they are arrested for obstruction of, a, of, the, of the work of a federal official, whatever the charges are, and, uh, and now anyone who is traveling to Oregon will be charged and arrested. And again, I'll go back to that statement. They said intent, so they're going to have to gauge intent. If you're traveling to Oregon, they need to, they're going to track down everything you're doing. They're going to try to gauge intent. And uh, so there you have it. What are your thoughts? Leave your comments below. Subscribe for updates. Push this out to your social networks. For the next news network, I'm Gary Franchi. My dear friends, I am so grateful to call you friends. Your support and actions have been humbling to our family for some time now. I reach out to you that you may know and understand that our circumstances are difficult. Also that you may know that the Lord has been with us in these our afflictions. It is obedience to the Lord and our following Him that has enraged our adversaries to bind and hold us away from our families, our place of worship, and to keep us from the sacred support which we owe our wives and our children. However, even in this time of bondage and tribulation, we have grown closer to the Lord. For this, we will always be grateful. I know He lives and desires all men to live free. He will make all things right in the end. All things will be restored, and all injustices will be corrected. In Him, all men have a choice to repent and allow Him to pay for their sins, or men must pay for their own sins which caused even Christ great suffering. I hope and pray that all of us who read these words will repent as needed, clear our lives up from any wickedness, and accept the Lord's gift, and then do this for the rest of our lives. Love one another, love your neighbors, and take care of your families. Stand for freedom. For without freedom, wicked men would dictate your religion, your occupation, and the way you conduct your family and home. God, family, and home, please know that we are doing all we can to be released from this prison as free men, but being in bondage has rendered us nearly helpless. Our attorneys are hard at work, but also up against this unsanctioned system of force and control. Powerful people are punishing us as political enemies and are using the people's power to do it. The Lord is our only hope. He has the power to deliver us. He can do it at any time. We have faith that He will do so, and that we may return home to our family soon. We ask you to pray to the Lord with all your hearts that He will show you what you can do to act and help. Pray to Him that His power will show forth that the Constitution will be upheld, and we will be released in His due time. With great love, Ammon Bundy.
I've never had that happen to me before as a presiding officer, and I don't recall it ever happening to me since I've been in the legislature. So it was uh, a very dramatic okay. uh, shock and awe experience, not to be melodramatic. It was, uh, right, right. it really frightened uh, a lot of legislators. They were frightened because we didn't know, we didn't know what was going to happen up right. there, whether the projectiles would be thrown. We didn't know what was happening, and I, if you, yeah, if you did, and because the uh, somewhat were overwhelmed you know, by it, we got overwhelmed. We were struggling to get the state police there because they were so occupied on the other side of the building, and uh, All right. and the, and we, we were deliberating. Some, you know, we were voting in bills, okay. and working with All bills, right. and working with an agenda. So okay. we uh, we were. Uh, okay. I okay. had to make split-second okay. decisions, uh, you know, do you keep going? I, I, I was trying to get the state police there. They weren't coming. <coughs> it was getting worse, I thought. It was getting louder and worse, plus I couldn't. I was looking at both sides, and it was coming from both sides, and I just didn't. So I made the decision to get off the floor, get off the floor, for safety reasons. If you don't want to know the truth, there was safety. I, there mm -hmm. was fear, but there was safety. I mean, I do have a responsibility to to the state senators, their staffs, to the press, I think, I don't know whether it's a press on the floor or not, to get them off the floor. Because uh, we had an incident years ago where we immediately got people off the floor because someone invaded the chamber with a knife, although we were coming onto the floor and there was a safety issue. So this is the worst thing I've, time I've had as a presiding officer since that day when I was coming onto the floor and someone broke through the main doors with a knife in his hand. But The occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge ended a week ago today, but the legal battles in courts will continue for some time. Wanda Moore joins us now with the latest in the saga. Wanda? Well, Dan, big news tonight regarding Grand County Sheriff Glenn Palmer. The state's law enforcement licensing board is asking the Department of Justice to investigate Grand County Sheriff Palmer. Palmer made some controversial comments in the past, sympathetic towards the militants. The DOG now could revoke Palmer's license as a law enforcement officer. Meanwhile, federal prosecutors are throwing the book at Cliven Bundy and others. A 50-page indictment against Cliven Bundy and his role in the standoff with federal agents in 2014 in Nevada over grazing rights. Nearly two years after that high-profile incident, Bundy was arrested at the Portland airport while on his way to support his sons Ammon and Ryan, now in prison on federal conspiracy charges. But the federal government is not only going after Cliven Bundy. They also indicted Ryan and Ammon Bundy, as well as Ryan Payne and Pete Santilli for their roles in the Nevada standoff, which prosecutors call a, quote, massive armed assault against federal law enforcement officers. The indictment alleges, quoting here, the defendants recruited, organized, and led hundreds of others in using armed force against law enforcement officers. And the list of charges is significant. Sixteen felony charges, including conspiracy, assault, and obstruction of justice. That's not all. There's also five counts of criminal forfeiture against each defendant. If convicted, they would have to turn over property allegedly obtained through the proceeds of their crimes, totaling at least three million dollars. The government says Cliven Bundy has been trespassing on federal public lands for over 20 years. That's after he stopped paying grazing fees. After several warnings over the years, the federal government decided to seize Bundy's cattle. That's when Bundy called for armed supporters to come to his ranch. Hundreds showed up, and Bundy said he was ready to, quote, do whatever it takes. All 16 of these charges stem back from that 2014 Nevada standoff. That's in addition to those charges many of these individuals are already facing regarding the Oregon standoff. Now you can read the whole indictment in the online version of this story later on tonight at KTVZ.com. Dan, back to you. We have Gina from Los Angeles, California on the line. Gina, you there? Yes, Mark. How you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Fantastic. Well, welcome to the show. But you're going to be, uh, I guess, in San Pedro doing a San Pedro protest for the Hammonds. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, you know, the, the Hammonds, Dwight and Stephen Hammond turn themselves in to the prison right here on Terminal Island in San Pedro, uh, January 4th. Some of the family does live here locally in Southern California, so they'll be there joining us. And, um, you know, the, the story is just, it's just so heart, heartbreaking. Um, you know, 
you know, one of the family members was sharing with me today about their last, um, the last Thanksgiving that they had together and um, just how their hearts were aching. And um, I talked with, uh, with the woman who actually drove drove uh, Dwight and Stephen to prison when they turned themselves in January 4th. And it was just, it's just heartbreaking that, um, you know, they, she talked about how hard they've been working to keep that day from coming, uh, yet the government prevailed and, and their loved ones are now sitting in, in prison. And uh, they're not terrorists. We know they're not terrorists. They're, they're hardworking ranchers, and it, it's just um, it's just criminal that uh, these terrorist laws are being used against American people. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, th- there was another case with a, some ranchers named Haig, and a federal judge said that the BLM was engaged in decades-long criminal conspiracy against ranchers and uh, actually referred the matter to the attorney general. So, you know, we know the Hammonds aren't the only ones that have been persecuted. It's, it's been going on for, for decades. It continues to go on. Um, I mean, I know I was just so outraged when I heard about, you know, they, they make these excuses for why they need to take people's property. And, you know, they were talking about trying to save turtles out in Nevada. But once they actually got the land, then they, the government said, well, we can't afford to feed the turtles. Uh-huh. So they euthanized all of them. Right. And it, the stories that, and, that are coming to light now are just outrageous. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm glad that the, the truth is finally coming out. And, um, you know, Californians can't afford to, to sit back and, and think that this is something that's happening far away from us. Mm-hmm. You know, President Obama was just here in California this week claiming 1.8 million acres around Joshua Tree as federal land. And we know that this is absolutely unconstitutional. California, we can manage our own land. We don't need the federal government coming in here and taking our land. Welcome back. As regular viewers, you know that DML and Unfiltered have made a commitment to stay on top of and keep you informed on the Bundy situation in their fight against the abusive powers of the BLM. Tonight, I have an exclusive interview with Lisa Casey, Ammon Bundy's co-counsel in the case. Lisa, before we start the questioning, I just want to update our viewers really quickly. Yesterday, a federal grand jury indicted Cliven Bundy, Ammon's father, and Ammon and three others on 16 charges. These charges carry a lot of time with them, and uh, there was a bail hearing for Cliven yesterday as well. He was denied bail on the basis that he represents not only a flight risk, but he is a dangerous human being. I know for a fact, and Dennis and I spoke about this this morning, Cliven's been free to roam about the country and has, as a matter of fact, for the last 22 months, which is how old these charges are. So, Lisa, I know you can't talk about Cliven. I understand that you address only Ammon as, as counsel, but this is a bizarre situation at the least. It's unusual, that's for sure. I think it's important for people to understand that the federal scheme for bail and for release actually presumes release at the outset. And only on the government's motion to say that someone is dangerous or a flight risk can we even have the release hearings that we had for Ammon. And the government made that motion, and and for Ammon, um, we argued that he was neither that as Cliven has been, Ammon has been free to travel and to go around the country and do as he pleases for the past 22 months, and he's still here. And he will run to this argument, not from it. He, he wants to argue his case in the court. <laughs> yeah, if there were ever a group of people that wanted to fight this case in court and, and garner publicity, it would seem that it would be the Bundy's. Uh, it, it's a, it's an odd notion. The, the judge saying in Cliven's case, you know, if we don't keep him locked up, he's going to continue his anti-government rhetoric. It seems by keeping him locked up, they're doing him a huge favor in the sense that they are advancing the argument that the government is, in fact, abusive in its power. Well, and that's the problem with pretrial detention. Um, you know, we've talked about Ammon being in solitary confinement for the first couple of weeks uh, that he was in jail. And although he's been moved out of that, Mm -hmm. 
it's difficult to assist in your own defense when you are in a cell. As people know, Ammon is an educator. He's an orator. He, he writes, and he likes talking to people about the Constitution and educating people about their rights. And that's very difficult to do from a jail cell, and it's very difficult to assist his attorneys in, in defending him. That's something that we're dealing with. Yeah, no, I was shocked, and I had to make repeated calls to the to uh, Lieutenant Alexander there, at the, who represents the the jail, in uh, in the jail where he's being held, and I couldn't get a straight answer for days about whether he, they, he and and the others were being held in solitary until finally they could confirm. Oh no, we just released them. Right. I, I mean, as as attorneys, we we've established a good relationship with with the deputies and the lieutenants there. They've been good about giving us information as part of Ammon's legal team, uh, but that does not uh, take away from the difficulty that we've had even in trying to call Ammon and talk with him. This is a case that requires a lot of contact between an attorney and client. And Lisa, i got to cut you custody. off because we got to run, but difficult. thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Yeah, breaking news on Nevada rancher Cliven Bundy. Federal officials just confirmed U.S. Marshals will move him from Oregon to Nevada. Bundy was arrested in Oregon on his way to support militia members at a wildlife refuge, but the case against him is about the armed standoff in 2014 at his ranch in Bunkerville. He and four others, including two of his sons, face charges that include use of firearms and assault. That's the latest from the Breaking News Center. <laughs> This is Ammon Bundy. I just wanted to um, give you a statement about the Nevada indictment, uh, the Bundy Ranch. Um, and again, just to help people understand that this is just a continuation of government trying to protect its own power, um, government taking uh, land that does not belong to them from the people. Uh, this is a continuation of them overreaching, going far beyond their constitutional bounds and showing that they are willing to use the court system to prosecute people that were defending their rights, that defending their property. And uh, don't forget what happened at the Bundy Ranch, that they killed cattle, that they tased people, that they threw women on the ground, that they sick their dogs uh, on pregnant women, that they beat, gang beat uh, men to the ground for filming them with their iPad and that they set up a First Amendment right, uh, area and saying that you cannot protest, protest outside those corrals. Don't forget what happened at the Bundy Ranch and how important this is that we make a stand. Thank you. In this present crisis, Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem.
On Friday, Sandra Anderson, one of the final four militants arrested in the armed occupation of a federal wildlife refuge in Oregon, was granted a pretrial release from jail on condition that she avoid contact with any of her co-defendants. The condition includes her husband. 47-year-old Sandra Anderson, along with her spouse, 48-year-old Sean Anderson, and two others, surrendered peacefully to the FBI on February 11th. The, the surrender ended a 41-day standoff at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in remote eastern Oregon. The four holdouts were indicted the prior week, along with 12 others previously arrested. One of the 12 included protest leader Ammon Bundy. They were all charged with conspiring to impede federal officers during the occupation.